published research on the environmental effects of dental mercury toxicity. Thanks. Uh, I would suggest, if you can't see the blackboard, come closer. First of all, because it's a funny cartoon, but uh, it'll help you see what I'm presenting a little bit, too. So if you're in the back, I would encourage you to move up. Um, if you can't see this in the back, we need the lights down, too, here. A little too small to show up here. A um, couple of scientists from the ADA and the FDA. Here's mercury and a bunch of other metals. And this says, then a miracle occurs, and amalgam and no more mercury. And the guy is saying, I think we should be more explicit about step number two here. It's, it's funny if you could see it. Trust me. This is the, the Milan room, but this is my picture from Florence and Tuscany. I didn't coordinate the rooms right here. So this is on the bonded restorative dentistry for the biological dentist. And I recognize that in this room there's a wide variety of experience levels of people who have uh, been doing this for many years. Some of you who have uh, been doing bonded dentistry for a while but are new to biological dentistry. And some of you may be new to kind of both concepts. And I hope that I'll be able to present some things that will be useful to all of those different levels. That's, that's quite a challenge, but that's what I'm going to try and do. So by the end of this, you will come out of this with, with something useful. My basic premise, kind of two of them. The first is that a good biological dentist should also be a good restorative dentist. If you are putting yourself out there in the community as a biological dentist, especially as an IOMT accredited member, which I hope you, uh, if you haven't already, you would uh, achieve that, you have a, a level of expertise that's head and shoulders above the dentists in your community and your ability to help people in, in, a, in ways that you know, m most general dentists just have no clue. And patients are going to be seeking you out for that expertise. And I contend that you need to also be able to deliver excellence in restorative dentistry as well as your expertise in caring for that pa uh, patient in terms of biological dentistry. So I, I think the two need to go hand in hand. Unfortunately, what I have seen is they don't always necessarily do so, and I'm trying to help encourage that. Um, it, the flip side of that coin is that if many dentists are very good and excellent at doing high quality restorative dentistry, but kind of don't get it in terms of biological dentistry. So they're missing a, a part of this as well. So we have to kind of put these two things together and that's what we'll be mostly talking about here today. I have some ideas of what I think I mean by excellence, and I'll go through these later one at a time, but just quickly we're talking about various points here. Understanding the properties of a variety of dental materials, uh, a gentle caring technique, prevention of post-op sensitivity. Nestor covered this very well in the presentation earlier, and if you didn't see his, um, look at it on DVD. Um, pulp protection, understanding occlusion, excellent bonding technique, um, proper proximal contacts and embrasures, caries control and prevention, aesthetic excellence. These are some of the things I will try and touch on here. So any of us who have been doing this for a while have seen a variety of qualities of dental work that comes in from other dentists into your practice. Some of it may be really good. Some of it is not very good. A lot of it is just kind of mediocre. And it's, I think it's a shame to see so much mediocre dentistry out there, and, and I don't think we should be doing any of that. This is kind of mediocre stuff here. I mean, they sort of filled the hole in these teeth, but uh, it's, it's not a very high-quality restoration, and, and they're breaking down as a result. This, I I'm, hope these are showing up well enough. And again, if, if these aren't real clear, move up a little closer. But this is a, uh, a little bit of better restoration, but it doesn't have a very good proximal contact if you look closely at it. Not much occlusal anatomy. They didn't restore the rest of the tooth for some reason. I, I don't know. Here there was uh, an effort to stretch and close a, a contact here. Um, and they sort of did that. But again, this is just kind of a mediocre filling. It's probably not going to hold up very well. This is kind of more what we're, 
I think we should be striving for. This second bicuspid has a DO that has a, a really nice proximal contour and contact. The tissue is going to be happy here. Uh, the, the restoration is going to last a long time. The occlusal anatomy mimics the tooth next to it. Why? You know, not just because it looks prettier, but there's a reason why the tooth was built that way in the first place. We ought to be restoring that, restoring it to the way it originally was. And I think you get a lot more personal satisfaction out of creating a nice restoration that you're happy with and really looks nice and you can be proud of. And it gives a nice kind of wow factor to the patient as well, which doesn't hurt. Here, a couple of posterior composites that were um, maybe two, three years old, holding up well. Nice occlusal anatomy, again, that mimics how the tooth originally was. So I'm talking kind of the difference between sticking in a filling or restoring the tooth. And I would encourage that we should be restoring teeth. Here, these look not too bad, not perfect. But I would tell you these have been in the mouth for 18 years. And for that, I think these are pretty darn good. They're not, a couple of them are got some small problems with them. But when you hear dentists say, oh, you can't do composites on posterior teeth because they're only going to last three or four years, well, that may be true if you don't know how to do them right. But even back 18 years ago when we didn't have as good of materials and bonding materials, you can still get nice restorations if you take your time. I'm not intending this as a substitute for a comprehensive continuing workshop on, on uh, bonded dentistry. I would encourage all dentists to take such a workshop. And I'm talking about an intensive hands-on two or three day workshop that a, a number of outfits put on. They're, uh, they're very good. Uh, I know you didn't learn posterior bonded dentistry in dental school. So you have to pick it up somewhere and you either kind of muddle through and learn it on your own or pick up little bits of pieces here and there, but nothing substitutes for a good um, hands-on intensive workshop, and I, I would recommend all of you do that if you haven't already. I'm certainly not saying there's a single best way to do things. I'm just going to be kind of telling you some things about my technique that I've developed over the years and continued to change and evolve over the years, and this is sort of what I'm currently doing. And I hope that you'll come away with some tips that might be useful for you. These are some of the people that do some good training courses. They're expensive um, compared to the incredible value you get at a weekend like this, but they are good courses. So begin with understanding the properties of a variety of dental materials. If you're committed to biological dentistry, you have patients with a variety of biocompatibility issues. Some patients are, will be fine with probably no matter what you stick in their mouths, but you have some patients that may be very compromised by putting the wrong material in their mouth, and that's why we have all this uh, information and, and different ways of testing individual biocompatibility of dental materials. That means that you can't just pick your favorite material that you like and say, well, uh, I like Herculite and I'm going to just use that because it works well. Well, it may not work well in terms of biocompatibility. A biological dentist has to be flexible to be familiar with and understand the various properties of uh, different materials, whether it's composites or bonding agents and or you know all those uh, things that go into making a, a restoration. So you have to, you and your staff, your dental assistant, has to be uh, competent in knowing the different properties and how to work with different materials. And that means you have to have an inventory of materials more than the dentist down the street who just picks a material and this is what I use for posterior composites. So it's a bit more difficult, but it's what we're committed to as biological dentists. Of course, we want to be outstanding at patient comfort, gentle caring technique, understanding how to prevent post-op sensitivity. We'll talk a little more about that. You know, maybe you do, or somebody on your staff does follow-up calls to see how you do and uh, how did the procedure go yesterday. 
basically pamper your patients. And again, you're, you're being perceived by patients as an expert in a field that very few have expertise in. And it's nice to just kind of build on that and, and wow them with good service as well. So in terms of excellent technique of bonding, the goal is a, a long-lasting restoration, preventing marginal failure, pulp protection for comfort and preventing um, you know, endodontic problems, to create proper proximal contacts and contours and embrasures is not an easy task with composite. It's pretty simple to do with amalgam. I, I think I remember. It's been a long time. But it's not so easy with composite. And this is uh, one of the areas that I see most failures and, and most mediocre restorations. But doing it right will bring comfort to the tissue, um, the gingival health will be good. It's going to last a long time. It's going to work. You won't have food impaction with open contacts or irregular contacts. You have to understand occlusion. And there, again, there are intensive courses on occlusion one can take. And it's probably a good idea, if you've never done so, to uh, really take some kind of good courses to understand occlusion well. And again, there's no right way. Uh, because there's a lot of different philosophies of occlusion, but you need to have a good background and understanding there. So dentists have always, traditional dentists have always said, you can't use posterior composites and posterior t teeth because they're not going to hold up very well. And I just want to say, yes, we can. No laps. OK, this just jumped ahead on me just a minute. This button's been doing this a lot. Get back there. I'm sorry, you guys. Proper attention to, to occlusion is one of the keys to have lasting restorations. I'm a big, I'm, I'm big on anatomy. I think again, uh, you should be creating a restoration and not just placing a filling. It will have better function, better aesthetics, better longevity. You will get better personal satisfaction out of what you're doing. And again, you're going to wow the patient a little better. You know, it's nice when you sit up and finish and you give them a mirror and they look and they, and they say, oh, that's neat. They don't look like those black, ugly fillings anymore. That's kind of one level. But when they look in the mirror and they say, wow, I can't even tell which tooth you worked on. You know, it's a it's a little different level, and they're the ones that are going to talk about you. So we'll go over a few uh, basics and a few tips on any of those of you who are newer to amalgam-free bonded dentistry. Um, pretty much it's clear that you can't use amalgam techniques on composite. They're two whole different worlds. Composite does not condense. You have to understand about polymerization shrinkage. I'll talk a little more about that. Understanding proper layering technique and depth of cure and how to create contacts. And as I said, occlusion is so critical. So we'll kind of go over these as we go through a step-by-step -step process on a single tooth here and, and how I do it and why. So if we look at tooth preparation you know we need protective protocols, as the fundamentals course teaches. Um, the question of rubber dam or no rubber dam, when you're removing amalgam, you kind of know there's two sides of that. But when you're doing the bonding and placing the restorations, I think you need rubber dam. Uh, Nestor earlier uh, agrees, and that was a, a thing that he felt was real critical for getting a successful result. I think you need rubber dam any place you possibly can when you're doing bonded dentistry. Magnification is a must. You need to be able to see what you're doing. Um, on these pictures that I'm showing, some of these are blown up pretty big. You should be able to see them at least that well in the mouth. Carries indicator dye helps you know when you've really got the last of the decay out. But we know that beyond that decay, there are still some more bacteria. 
how do we deal with that? Uh, and again, we'll get into some of those things. I will talk a little bit about ozonated oxygen. You've seen um, one of the booths back there, and maybe you have taken a course or have heard that there are courses available on using ozone, ozonated oxygen in dentistry, and I think it's wonderful. I'm a huge fan of ozone. This is an ozone machine that I have. We'll talk a bit about that, but here it's ozone is being placed in the tooth preparation prior to bonding. This will penetrate into the dentinal tubules and destroy remnants of bacteria that are kind of hiding out there better than just about anything we, else we have to, uh, to scrub and clean that prep with. Matrix placement on a posterior composite. Boy, if you're still using Toffelmeyer matrixes, forget about them. You need some kind of a good sectional pre-contoured matrix. Um, Paladent is one you'll see on some pictures here. There are other good ones. Um, a lot of good products have, have come out to try and uh, accommodate this idea that making a proper contact is, is tricky. Wedging, um, a retainer ring, there's various systems out there and you'll need to sort of find which one you like to work with, but you can't use an old Toffelmeyer. Uh, if you're dealing with multiple teeth or multiple surfaces, I don't think that you can just line them up and slap six different um, adjacent matrices and wedges and things and do the whole quadrant all at once, I don't think you'll end up with a good result. You, have, you, you can't do too many surfaces at once when you're doing a quadrant. You gotta slow down, do it a little bit at a time and get the right kind of contact and contour. This is a picture of one system I took out of a magazine. And here even, just a simple MOD, you've got good matrices, pre-contoured matrix on each side here. Even here, I, I might not try and just do this all at once. I might rather uh, do what I need to do on one um, distal here with this wedge loose and this wedge tight. And once this has been more completed and cured, I would loosen this wedge, tighten this wedge, maybe even take out that matrix, and then finish this other, almost like treating it as two separate teeth. It takes longer, you'll get a better proximal contact and contour that way. And then we'll get into uh, these other steps of finishing and polishing, etc. So I'm going to show you some photos of, of um, one way of doing things. And I recognize some of you may have techniques that are better than this, but these work well. We'll look at a, a, how we deal with the proximal box. How do you layer it? Don't shortcut things. We, um, we'll look at this with some photos that makes more sense. So here's a tooth with a, just a kind of a typical class two preparation. And when we restore this, I'll, I'll go through this as if there was a matrix on here. We'll just say that that matrix is now invisible. And you've gone through preparing that tooth surface. Um, you've cleaned it. In my practice, I would have used a um, micro etcher to clean the, the dentin surface and the enamel really thoroughly, rinsing that real well, maybe then going to another cleanser disinfectant such as Concepsis scrub. And beyond that, I would then go again with ozone and treat this dentin surface with ozone to uh, make sure we eradicated the possibility of any other uh, microbes in there. So the first layer in your proximal box, I use a flowable composite. You can do this with um, resin modified glass ionomer. I like doing a flowable composite. It's a little hard to see here, but it's, it's just about less than a millimeter in depth. It's just to seal the very bottom of the proximal box and up against the matrix. And you will get a better seal here that's not gonna pull away when you start curing the rest of the composite. And I think this is an area where there's a lot of failures. Here, this composite, I think, failed because it began to break down at that gingival margin and allowed uh, caries to enter in there. So this is a critical area.
this just shows the kind of contour you can achieve with a, a good matrix placement and a good pre-contoured matrix and, and taking a little time and care. So the next layer is going to go in in the proximal box and, and how many layers, as Nestor mentioned, is going to depend on how deep that proximal box is. You don't want to overdo it with too thick of a layer. Number one, it may not cure properly, but number two, you're going to have polymerization shrinkage that's going to create either some sensitivity or some failure where it's pulling away from the bonded margin and not giving you the proper uh, seal. So it takes some time to build some layers, but it's worth it. Here now, we begin filling up, restoring, excuse me, the occlusal part. And if you just place composite filling the, the whole rest of this occlusal part and cure it, you're going to get into the problem of polymerization shrinkage pulling against these cusps and creating a stress factor there that's going to mean post-op sensitivity. So what I tend to do is uh, restore one side here on the lingual and cure that. And as I do this, I'm contouring this in the soft stage to already uh, mimic the original contours here instead of just sticking in a layer and figure you can, uh, you're going to buzz it down later with your burrs. You can do a lot with contouring right at this stage that saves you a tremendous amount of work later. So this follows some nice contour and comes down to about halfway um, buccalingually on this surface, this uh, occlusal part. So from the top, it's looking like this. And we've placed some little grooves, developmental grooves, just with your plastic instrument, and you cure it. And you don't have to do very much to this when, when we're finished with the restoration. The next layer is going to go on this side. And what's neat when you do this, as you place this composite layer um, up against what you've already created here, it's going to create a nice little occlusal groove that looks just like the, the tooth looked originally. And you don't have to go in there with a sharp burr and create anatomy and occlusal grooves because you've already done it in this soft stage. And we also then have to face the idea that some composites work better at this than others. Some composites are nicely sculptable, some aren't. And you may deal with a patient that has to use a particular composite. You don't particularly like its properties of sculptability, but you have to do the best you, you can with that. So here we place the next layer and uh, cured it. And again, as, we, as I placed it, I've just followed the contours that we want to create in the soft stage before it's cured. So here's the restoration cured. And you don't have to do very much to this with burrs at the end. You've already created some nice natural looking anatomy, which uh, much less work at the end. And that's after it's been um, polished. OK, so again, I don't want to beat this to too much here, but in an occlusal here, one layer is going to go up against one wall. That's going to get cured. You won't have uh, cusps pulling and uh, distorting because of placing too few layers and, and uh, not allowing for the polymerization shrinkage and accounting for that. So then a second layer. And here again, just a simple plastic instrument, create the little developmental grooves while it's still soft, save you some time later. This is jumping again. Sorry, we've had some trouble with this button. Let me get right back to where I was. You know, the button is so sensitive, if you push it just a little too hard, it just jumps. <laughs> Thanks. So when you're doing bonding, you have to choose your bonding agent. And this may depend on uh, 
biocompatibility issues of that patient. And you need to understand that different bonding agents have different properties, different techniques. You've got to read the instructions. You can't do the same way on this one that you did on the one yesterday. Um, there's the total edge versus, you know, Nestor described this all quite well in, in, the, in the previous presentation. What you'll see on uh, the composites that I've got in this presentation, most of these we use Clearfill SE. So here's a um, DO on this upper uh, second bicuspid. We have a matrix in place a pre-contoured matrix with a wedge retained with a bitene retainer ring. Um, this contour, when we're done and take this off, is going to have a real nice proximal contour that we're not going to have to do very much to. So this, I think, shows the first layer in place in the proximal box. And as, as I said, just a thin layer, just enough to seal that against the matrix. When you have this is a consequence of not using a very good matrix technique or the wedging got in the way here and you got a kind of a screwy contour here. This is a real straight, flat contour, probably something like a Toffelmeyer band. It works, but the tissue's not going to be as happy. It's not going to be as uh, cleanable with flossing or whatever technique. Oh, here's another tip I thought I would just throw in here. When you're doing a mesial on a posterior molar here, and you have a band, you may have some different choices of sizes of bands, but your band may tend to look something like this. You've got it uh, placed where you know you're going to get good contours, but it's sticking up and it's hard to see down into that proximal box. And rather than fight things, you know, why not just trim it away, take a uh, diamond and just cut this away. And then you can see down in there what you're doing. This just seems so simple, but I, I, I'm surprised how many dentists don't think of this. So I just thought I'd throw this in. You haven't compromised the, the shape of the band at all. You just have better visibility. So here we're starting to do the layering as I was describing. And we're, we're, we're building up more of this proximal box. Uh, looks like this had one layer on the lingual here also. Again, we've created a little bit of grooves. When we build this next layer, it's going to kind of fall right into that and, and create anatomical form almost without trying. And here it's cured and matrix off. Sorry for the focus here. And this is when it's been finished. But if you can see, even without the great focus here, this is almost finished without even touching it with a burr. And that's finished and polished. So you can minimize finishing by doing most of your contouring before it's cured. Um, use your favorite techniques of whatever, using diamonds, finishing burrs, finishing strips, discs. I happen to like this as one of the things I use. It's a Brassler kit. Uh, Design from David Hornbrook. Um, various things for trimming and polishing. You'll, you'll get your own technique. There's so many products out there that are designed just for finishing and polishing composites. But again, you don't have to work too much with these if you uh, create in the, uh, before you bond it, create the, the kind of contours and anatomy that you want and, and don't overfill excessively. Um, I would recommend when you think you're all done, go back with a sharp explorer and feel around the lingual walls and lingual surfaces. So often, your bonding uh, resin, when you blow it dry, uh, goes up over the enamel and leaves a film that you can't see. But when the patient goes home that night, they feel oh, this tooth feels a little rough. And all you need to do is, is feel. You can't, you won't see it, but if you feel it with your explorer, you can just flick it off, and you'll know that surface is nice and smooth. Some bonding agents do this more than others. Composites are unforgiving compared to amalgams when you're talking about occlusion. You really need to look carefully at adjusting the occlusion here and make sure you're not creating any prematurities. I like to use Parkale AccuFilm. We coat just a little thin coating of, of uh, Vaseline on here, or I prefer to use unpetroleum jelly. 
it will give you a, a much more uh, accurate and readable mark. You don't have to get the teeth bone dry to get a good accurate mark with this. Um, check them when they're reclined, check them again when they're sitting upright, and always make sure to, to tell them when the numbness wears off over the next day or two, if you feel anything that feels like even the slightest discrepancy, don't let it go, let me know about it. Come back in, often we need to do a follow-up adjustment. I hate it when patients come back six months later and they said, you know, this, is, this has always been kind of hurting, it's always felt kind of high. Well, why didn't you let us know? That's one of the major causes of post-op sensitivity is, is a little bit of inaccuracy on the occlusion and it doesn't take much. Okay, so again, don't just place a filling, restore the tooth. In my view, post-op sensitivity is usually going to come from either occlusal disharmony, bacterial contamination, and as I said, uh, I, I can't say enough about the, uh, the use of ozone uh, to ensure you've got bacteria dealt with, and also shortcutting the layering process. The polymerization stresses, you have to understand what that does and how that works. That's the, the, the next most common area of creating post-op sensitivity. Uh, a quick look at uh, class 5 root surface lesions. Again, sometimes these are at or under the gum line. Some dentists will say there's, you can't control moisture, you can't do a composite here. Um, okay, I'll go back to you. Yes, we can. Um, you have to get good ideal isolation for bonding. Sometimes on real incipient class 5 lesions, you can use ozone and in a sense kind of zap them and arrest the decay, maybe follow up with some MI paste, and you may never have to restore it at all. Here's a, a quick view of a, a fairly simple small class 5. They, I think they're routinely pretty easy to restore. Some are more challenging depending on the location. Uh, most of what you can uh, accomplish here with packing cord will solve a, a lot of problems. So I use double O braided packing cord soaked in hemodent. You've, you've done the preparation. You've cleaned it up, um, disinfected it. Maybe you've used ozone. Now you're ready to restore. The packing cord will isolate this nicely, gets the tissue out of the way, keeps it dry, and you can do a good job of, of whatever bonding technique is appropriate here. Uh, another one similarly, this is going to go, I, I would say that this one failed because moisture was not controlled and the original bonding probably never was uh, adequate and that bonding broke down and the seal broke down and carries, etc. Again, you can isolate it nicely. Sometimes packing the cord here takes longer than any other step in this whole procedure to get it right and, and be kind to the tissue and get the kind of isolation that you want, but it, it does work. I'll talk a little bit about indirect restorations. When do you choose direct versus indirect? And you know, I won't go into that kind of thing. That gets a little more complex. I'm just checking the time here. We'll talk about the preparation, treatment, uh, well, all the steps here one at a time. Here's a situation where I chose that this second molar could be treated fine with a direct composite, but this we were going to do indirect. It's a very large amalgam. It's got cracks. Um, if you try and restore this with composite, it's not going to succeed long term. If you do a full crown, it will work fine, but I think you can conserve tooth structure a lot better here and not have to cut everything down to do a full crown. Here is um, amalgam removed, and you see this nice black schmutz under amalgams, which you almost always see. And these are the preps completed. And again, even when you know that all the de decay is gone, you have this discoloration. You're not going to try and remove all the discoloration, but you also know that there probably is some bacteria below this surface. And here, treating the surface again with ozone is a, a nice technique. I also really like to use the uh, micro-etcher. And this is the tooth really cleaned up nicely with, with micro-etching. Now you can go into your, um, the next steps of treating the dentin. 
I prefer, uh, well, here this one's been restored. Uh, I prefer at this point to do bonding and then a thin layer of flowable composite at this point to cover the entire dentin. This will reduce sensitivity. It'll create a nice smooth surface for your technician to, uh, for the impression and for your technician to build to in the lab and keeps things more comfortable. Then you're going to take your impressions, etc. Um, the question was, do I then remove that bonding layer when we go to cement it? No, I'll get to that in, in a second here. Um, you've taken your impressions and you now need to make a temporary. Don't use a tin can. I think all of you realize that. But you sometimes need to follow compatibility parameters when you're making a temporary. Some materials are going to be more suited to some individuals. Exact attempt is one I tend to use a lot when I can. You want to try and create good margins, good anatomy, proper interproximal contours, not just because it's going to be more comfortable, but the tissue is going to be healthier. Um, you'll have uh, a lot less work to do on the next visit when you take that temporary off. I recommend you need to have a, a chair side assistant who's really good at this. And I would recommend for a while at least that you check the occlusion at the very end. If you're not doing the temporary, you know, let them do everything, but you check the occlusion at the end until you get really comfortable in knowing that they can do a good job of making sure that temporary uh, is not uh, creating occlusal interferences that's going to bother that patient for the next two weeks. And give patients clear instructions on how to take care of their temporary. I think it's a good idea to give them a written sheet that goes along with your verbal instructions so when they come back um, and they tell you, oh, this, oh yeah, my temporary has been off for five days, well, why didn't you call me? You know, if it's on your sheet, if your temporary comes off, call us right away. You know, make instructions clear and give them back up in writing. So here's a pretty decent temporary on this tooth. And I, I guess you didn't maybe see before, but you, you may have noticed that this tooth even before we, we did any finishing or polishing with a burr, looked almost complete uh, when it was just first cured. So seating, again, you should be using a rubber dam. Um, you're going to remove the temporary cleanup, the cement. Here I would go back to maybe answer your question. I'll micro-etch that layer again uh, just to roughen it up a little bit, but I'm not trying to remove that flowable layer that I placed on there. We'll clean it, uh, disinfect with a, a scrub, uh, try in and adjust um, the, uh, the restoration. Uh, at this point, I may ozone that again. I'll check the interproximal tissue under the, you know, is the rubber dam covering that tissue well? Do you have everything sealed well? Do you have any seepage of bleeding or, or tissue fluids that are going to interfere with a successful bond? And if so, you know, how are you going to deal with that uh, wedging, some kind of astringent? You need to have a, a real clear, dry field there. Even with a rubber dam, sometimes that's tricky. Uh, I placed the, uh, this is a, an onlay. This is made out of uh, IPS Empress in this example. I'll place that on a pick and stick. Is everybody familiar with a pick and stick? This kind of thing. It's a neat way to hold your onlay in place or a crown or inlay or whatever, and you can manipulate it, um, uh, place things on it or whatever, and, and you don't have to worry about holding it in, in your fingertips, which is very awkward. Is that superoxal? Is that a is it like an astringent? I will sometimes use superoxal like an astringent. If I just got a little spot of tissue, I just can't get that little bit of bleeding to stop, I'll use a little superoxal there. Yes, I know it burns the tissue. It turns it white. Um, they may feel that afterwards a little bit, but I find they don't really notice it very much. And sometimes, as a backup, it's a good way of, of controlling a little bit of gingival bleeding if it's, if it's a problem. Um, we're going to etch and bond both the tooth and the interior of the inlay or onlay. Um, I think I have something. Oh, we will have used a silanating agent on the internal of the onlay as well. These are details we don't have to get into great detail on. Um, but I'll 
place the bonding agent, both tooth and onlay, cure them both. And again, you have to choose your bonding material based on what you're doing. You have an, uh, you're going to be using a dual cure cement. You have to have a bonding agent that's compatible with a dual cure cement, and not all of them are. So with the onlay on the pick and stick, I would place a, a little thin layer of Vaseline or um, unpetroleum jelly on the proximal surface. So when you go to clean up, things aren't going to stick to that. You don't have to work so hard to clear the proximal contacts. And then you're going to kind of use your uh, cement to sort of butter it on the onlay there. There's the uh, unpetroleum jelly. You can place the cement either on the tooth prep or on the onlay. Either way works. I would prefer to do it this way. And then this gets uh, seated down, um, held and pressed to place. You're going to remove some excess with a rubber tip and an explorer. I would not floss at this point before, that it's, been, before it's been cured. I don't want to risk dislodging that a little bit. So I'll clean it up just like uh, as best I can with a rubber tip and an explorer then cure. I would cure with two light sources at the same time. One coming, whoop, again. I'm sorry, you guys. If you, hold, if you have two light tips at the same time, you can have one holding from the lingual, one holding from the buckle. You'll, you'll uh, reduce the time you're sitting there waiting for the darn thing to cure. And um, I think it's a good idea in terms of, you know, things that we were talking about of uh, polymerization, shrinkage, and stresses, and that kind of thing as well. All right, I'll try not to do that again. Once it's been cured, then you're going to clear that proximal contact. It may be real easy. You may need just to just floss through there. Um, sometimes you'll have a little bit of cement stuck there. This doesn't have to be a major battle. It was when I first started doing these, but it's not anymore. Um, you can clear that if you need to with a serrated strip, a serrated metal strip like a serra strip. Um, I would use then knotted floss. What I mean is tie a little knot in the middle of the floss so it forms a bump. Floss it down, let go of one end, pull it through the bump of that knot will pull out the, uh, the excess cement as well. Uh, you may want to then finish with the finishing strips, discs, burrs, whatever works. Remove the dam, check occlusion, do some final finishing and polishing. And some of the same um, instruments I would use for polishing composites I think can work fine for polishing uh, this kind of indirect ceramic as well. So here it's been uh, trimmed. I thought I had one without the rubber dam. But one of the nice advantages of indirect, besides strength, you have even more control over uh, contours and, and things before um, you go ahead and cement that on permanently and finally. But there's a finished product. So a couple things I'm going to just kind of skip over. And this is mostly what I wanted to cover here. But when you get into anterior or posterior, your choices of materials may handicap you. You may find that whatever, uh, Kerr 0.4 composite you love because it has nice aesthetic properties, it sculpts well or whatever. But this patient that's coming in, um, their compatibility testing won't let you use that. You have to use something else. And then that, that your ability to create and carve and aesthetic matching may be compromised from one material to the next. And this also holds true in the anterior. But even if you are um, restricted by the material you're using, you can get uh, a nice result aesthetically by doing nice occlusal anatomy and occlusal contour, uh, overall contouring and anatomy even if the shade doesn't match perfectly and the, and the surface texture isn't what you might like from another product, good anatomical form uh, uh, overcomes a lot of that. I'm not going to go into that. Um, a quick tip here. A patient came in 
saying, um, this crown has been bothering me that another dentist placed. They placed an all-ceramic crown, and it's, it's bothering me. And we took a, an x-ray, and this was the tooth she was talking about. Now, I know in the past I would have looked at that and said, that's not an all-ceramic crown. It's a PFM crown. How many of you have used zirconia crown, like lava? Okay, so that's what this is. And if you haven't seen these come back before in an x-ray, that's what they look like. On an x-ray, they look just like a PFM crown. And it's good to know that so you don't stick your foot in your mouth and tell the patient um, something that's not, not so there. Fooled me the first time. I think that's all. We're back to Florence. And we're done, unless you have uh, any questions. We can have a couple minutes of questions, but then we're going to get to the, uh, the sort of roundtable forum. Yes? Jim, you're using a cell-edge technique for, for bonding, so you're maintaining the sphere layer. Is the ozone still effective in that case? You would do the ozone first before any bonding agent goes on there. Right. But oh, will it penetrate the smear layer? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think it, well, it's, it's, it, if, it, if it doesn't, it sure sterilizes the smear layer. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. So, yeah. so what's the laundry list of the direct composites that you have in your armamentarium? In other words, you have percolite. I have a few favorites that it, we tend to use most often. Um, I guess right now, uh, Grandio is one of the favorites because it's seems Voco Grandio. It seems to come out so well on most compatibility testing. When we're not doing individual testing, that's the one I'll tend to fall back on because I feel more confident in. Right. I, I like Kerr's point four for some of its properties for anteriors. I like Four Seasons again from Kerr. Um, those are the favorites that I would like to use if the compatibility testing allows. Yes, of course. There's some products that on a real sensitive patient, we may come back with a, they can only use X, which I'm not going to say it out loud, but Diamond Crown sort of rhymes with Diamond Crown. Um, <laughs> people will come and say, I can only use Diamond Crown. I read this article, and it's the only compatible material you can use, and it doesn't have bisphenol A, and it's the best thing. In the, and, um, off the record, I think it's a piece of crap. I wouldn't put it in my patient's mouth. And, but, or if I had to, I would tell them, I don't think this is going to hold up. My experience is this doesn't hold up well long term. If we have to use this, we'll use it, but understand this is going to break down much sooner than other products might. So the four seasons, the boat, the grandio, what was the other? Point four, 